So in good faith, I should probably taper some expectations here. Out of all of our senses, hearing is by far the most sensitive. A loud, intense, annoying sound in energy terms is absolutely nothing compared to a energy production juggernaut such as this. The sound of this hammer drill is about 115 decibel and produces a whopping hundredth of a watt per square meter. In comparison, this candle is releasing about 100 watts of heat energy. Solar energy can, on average, produce 680 watts per square meter. Ah, sh I guess my point is, is that if you click this video expecting some sort of solution where sound would save the planet from the deadly oppression of energy scarcity, then this is probably bad news. But on the flip, if you wanted to play your favorite beach jams loud and proud for over 24 hours without needing to recharge your Bluetooth speaker, this is good news. Just like a child's confidence, if you scream at a wine glass long enough, it'll shatter. And I wanted to try this experiment for myself, but not as much as I wanted to own this wine glass, so I'll just show you a video of somebody else doing it. What's happening here is that the vibration of your voice is matching up with the size, shape, and absorption coefficient of the glass. And I realized that that sentence might not make that much sense when you actually break it down. And we also have to find that sweet spot in order to create as much energy as possible. So let's do a stupid metaphor. Sound is like a swing set. I am a 43 year old man alone in a children's playground. So let's make this quick. I am on a swing right now. To make the swing go higher, I can lean back and forth in harmony with the compressions and rarefactions, or the slow vibration of the swing. A smaller swing, or one with a shorter chain, would have a higher natural frequency, and it would require me to transition between leaning back and forth faster. Since I'd be leaning back and forth more times per minute, I'd be using more energy to make the swing go higher. What does this have to do with sound? So the higher the frequency, the more compressions and rarefactions need to be clumped into any unit of time, requiring more energy. So that's a pretty good indicator of why we might want to harness energy from a higher frequency than a low rumble. So we need to find an object of a material and size that vibrates rather easily and also resonates at a higher frequency, but not too high, otherwise we'll be limited by the second law of thermodynamics, which I, among some other people, believe in. So I guess we'll just go to a craft store. So I put a hole in the middle of my newly acquired pie pan and suspended it about an inch from some wood. Then I spent a little bit of time finding out where it resonates the most, then I stuck ceramic plates to those areas. Then I summed the output signal and hooked it up to a multimeter, and if it could create enough energy to power a low-power LED light, this will be a major success. Well, that certainly sucks. I suppose that if we turned an entire football field into a giant ceramic and copper sheet and converted the excess energy from the sound of a jet engine, I bet we could briefly power a table lamp. All this suspending stuff and shooting sound at it gave me an even better idea to make a sort of Helmholtz windmill. Hermann von Helmholtz was a physicist and a doctor and really just a brilliant jack of all trades scientist, although his contributions to mechanical engineering are probably the most notable. Here's a picture of him hanging out with what appears to be a human brain on a table. So if we blow on a bottle, Take that frequency and then shoot that frequency or sound back at the bottle with the loudspeaker. The vibration will make a tiny bit of air come out of the top. Seriously, this is an example of a Helmholtz resonator. Now, in an ideal world, I have a nice budget and an assistant who contacted a bunch of professional glass blowers to create me something like this for this video. Hopefully, you can see it. I just see a bunch of green. But in this perfect world, this would be made out of a very thin and fragile layer of glass or copper or even porcelain, basically a giant Christmas ornament. But since I don't live in a perfect world, I just had to buy a normal Christmas ornament. But regardless of size, this would be the ideal shape if you wanted to turn sound into wind. And let's see if we can create enough air to spin a tiny wind turbine that I made. And maybe then we could even light up some LEDs.
So if I just vanish and you don't hear from me after this video comes out, it's obviously because the fossil fuel industry saw this high-tech wizardry as too much of a threat and had me snuffed out. So it is kind of disappointing. If we make a custom Helmholtz resonator that creates airflow to a specific loud noise that is noise pollution somewhere, then I suppose we could spin a little windmill and light an LED. I would actually hedge my bets and say that more power could be generated by putting a well-made Stirling engine on top of an Xbox. So even if I was able to create some crazy structural pattern that could absorb 95% of the sound energy emitted from a specific source, the value would be much higher in merely providing a great way to eliminate noise pollution. These crazy sci-fi structural patterns are actually not hypothetical, they exist. They're called sonic crystals. And sonic crystals have the ability to manipulate sound waves in really clever and deceptive ways. For example, you would think that this would have little to no effect on sound passing through, but in some cases, it actually reduces decibels better than some solid walls or surfaces. If you are in the small minority of people still listening to me after clicking this video link, wait till you hear about phenonic crystals. Okay, so this stuff is mind-blowing, and I've been entranced by it for upwards of a decade, and still... I don't know how to break it down in a digestible way for a YouTube video monologue. I'm going to have to trade some technicalities for palatability, so bear with me, I'm going to do my best. So a phonon was originally theorized as the audio version of a photon. A phonon is a quasi-particle, which is another word for something that doesn't observably exist like an electron, but its effects can be observed. Here in Big World, where Einstein is daddy, a speaker will vibrate and that will send vibrations through the air and then a microphone will vibrate in the exact same pattern, reproducing whatever sound the speaker was playing. A perfectly placed second speaker that is emitting an inverted waveform of the first speaker will effectively cancel out the vibration and the microphone will hear nothing. This is how modern noise cancellation works. Here is a piece of paper. If we shoot sound at it, it will vibrate. But if we zoom in really, 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 really close to where the vibrations on the surface of it looked like they were going up and down by miles, you'd start observing atomic lattices or crystal structures. And you'd start noticing that they're being excited by something when sound is played. And that something would be a phonon otherwise known as the smallest unit of a sound wave. Okay, so up until just a few years ago, we weren't really able to detect phonons without destroying them as we had to convert them into electricity inside a quantum circuit. But a few years ago, we figured out how to fine tune those circuits to trap them and detect how much they changed electric current in a closed system. Here's why that's really important. So basically you would be able to store information much longer using much less space inside a quantum superconductor, which requires extreme cooling, so it would require less energy. What I'm saying is that phonons may actually be the X factor that allows us to achieve quantum supremacy, which sounds like a bunch of tiny racists, but it's referring to quantum computers surpassing binary computers and probably becoming conscious and killing us all. But in the meantime, being able to use phonons for acoustic energy translation actually redraws a massive question mark and maybe even gives a little bit of hope to the title of this video. Metamaterials can manipulate waves in absolutely insane ways. And as you may already know, the rules of classical physics are at odds with particle physics. So maybe in 30 years, we'll have a metamaterial coating that can absorb 100% of the traffic sound on an expressway and then convert it into enough power to light the street lights a half mile in front of the vehicle or something. I don't know. Another side of acoustic metamaterial research that is pretty exciting is in the ocean as sound travels a lot farther underwater. And there are a lot of really well-written papers proposing ideas. However, not a lot of funding for trying those ideas out. And then of course there is acoustic levitation, which is something I've done research on for the purpose of drug delivery, not like Amazon pharmacy, but delivering a drug to a specific organ. I made a video about it a while ago. The link is in the description. And I suppose it's worth mentioning that I'm on a very long waiting list for a three qubit quantum computer, and that'll definitely expand on some of the least engaging content I could possibly make on this platform. <laughs> a lot of times these sciencey videos really tank on this platform and don't even get shown to my subscribers. 
but I really do love making them, so I'm happy either way. But if you like this video and you want to see more content like this, then obviously subscribe and share it and all that stuff. But if you really like it and you want to join an incredible community of like-minded folks and participate in monthly songwriting challenges and download loads of music and audio assets, then my Patreon is right up your alley, and it costs as little as $1. Thanks for watching. Bye.